Hello, everyone. This is a discussion around generative AI in Wikipedia. For those of you who don't know me, I am Leanna Davis from Wiki Education, and I have a great panelist of longtime Wikimedians um, here. We've got, uh, when, I'll, I'll do some introductions. So, Carwell, do you want to introduce yourself first here since you are our uh, remote sure. participant? Hi, everyone. Um, it's very strange to not see the audience or the panel. Oh, I get to see the panel. Thank you. Um, my name is Carvel Bjork James. I am a professor of anthropology and law at Vanderbilt University, and I have been a Wikipedian since 2006. I serve on the board of Wiki Education, and um, I work a lot on uh, Indigenous peoples. Um, general representation, social movements. Uh, and I also have a research project on uh, political violence, um, one, of whose out, uh, one of whose output is um, writing historical narratives and when appropriate, adding them as articles on Wikipedia. Okay, thanks, Carol. Bob, Inter introduce yourself. <laughs> hello, hello. Oh, it's working now, great. Hey, my name is Bob Cummings. Um, I, when I edit, I like to edit uh, US properties on the uh, Register of Historic Places in my home state of Mississippi. I work at the University of Mississippi and uh, serve as a board member on Wiki Education Foundation. And I teach and I research digital writing. Mariana. Thank you. I am Mariana Pinchuk. I work at the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, I've been a Wikimedian and Wikimedia Foundation staffer since 2010, so I guess I'm an old bee now. Um, and I work on the Future Audiences Initiative, which is uh, a project of the foundation to do some R&D experiments um, around using new technologies to engage audiences in new ways. Okay, Jimena. Hello. Uh, I'm Jimena Gallardo. I teach at the City University of New York at LaGuardia Community College. Also at the Graduate Center, I teach something called interactive technology and pedagogy. So for about 10 years now, I've been teaching a course on web, the web and the internet, and all of these good things. So that's how I came in good faith to AI. Last but not least, Andrew. Yes, hi, I'm Andrew Lee. Um, currently, I work with the Smithsonian Institution as a Wikimedian at large on all kinds of different projects. Uh, before, in 2019, when I was doing the same kind of work with the Metropolitan Museum of Art, we'd done some AI projects with Commons and how to do um, image recognition in Commons artworks and creating a Wikidata game around that. So uh, only recently I've been playing with generative AI and been doing some experiments on English Wikipedia for article writing. So interested in the conversation. Great. Okay. Well, thank you all. I want to start with a little bit of an audience poll. Okay. So I want you to use your hands and do a thumbs up, a thumbs down, or somewhere in between. And the question is, is generative AI more of a threat or an opportunity for Wikipedia and the Wikimedia projects? And so you choose whether you're up, down. Okay. We have a a lot of mixed uh, messages. We've got a lot of thumbs downs and a lot of thumbs ups. I think we're pretty evenly. We've got some some wiggling going on there. Um, I think I think we're all in agreement that there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of threats, and a lot of we're not really sure. Um, and I think this panel will bring maybe more questions than answers, but it will hopefully uh, prompt some discussions. Um, I think as some level setting, one of the things I personally have been reflecting on this, I've been in this movement 14 years and specifically working, connecting Wikipedia and academia. And I remember the discussions of Wikipedia used in university contexts when I joined this movement 14 years ago. And they really mirror the discussions that are happening about generative AI today. Um, everybody's like, oh, it's unreliable. Don't use it. Just ban it. It's not a big deal. And that's exactly the same thing people are saying about generative AI today, and I think it's just as unhelpful today as it was 14 years ago about our projects. And so while we all may see the hallucinations, we all may dismiss it out of hand, I would encourage you to remember the community around us uh, when Wikipedia was first coming into being and remember how people dismissed us out of hand and look where we are today. Um, so please don't just dismiss generative AI out of hand, and this is an opportunity to sort of figure out what are ways we can work with this. 
Um, so I have a, a series of questions that I'm going to ask our panelists here. Um, and I was going to swap the order of these first two questions based on sort of what the results of the audience poll was. But since that was a little inconclusive, I'll just start with um, with the, the threats question. So anyone on the panel can jump in with this one. What do you think some of the biggest threats generative AI poses to Wikipedia as we are now? Jimena, go ahead. I think that the main threat overall, not just to Wikipedia, is the fact that we're probably in the next five years, a lot of users, a lot of writers are going to become, they're going to move from being creators of content to curators of content. And if we don't ramp up our reading, critical reading skills, we're going to not notice, you know, the omissions or the hallucinations, and then we're just going to you know, publish stuff that is not accurate because we're like too fast or whatever, particularly now that all of us are on social media brain, right? We're not going to see what is incorrect about what we're publishing and there's going to be a lot more mistakes, I think. That's that if we use it for as a writing tool or, you know, anyone else? Other thoughts? And Carwell, feel free to just jump in here. I know it's harder for you to participate virtually. Yeah, I was going to say, um, conceptually, I, I, I think that uh, it's useful that your your introduction lays out how Wikipedia and large language models, um, which I'm going to be really specific about calling things like ChatGPT that, um, and uh, and I think these like social networks, like um, in very different ways, Twitter and Stack Overflow, um, are all coordination mechanisms of fundamentally human creativity, and I think that. Um, instead of thinking of these as like primarily building an artificial external intelligence, it's like, how is how is the remixing happening? Um, and I think that um, in the last year, we've had this crazy, very visible um, prioritization of uh, large language models as the way of uh, synthesizing content. And we're seeing a lot of uh, the internet, right? Um, Microsoft, Google, et cetera, um, taking those on as the sort of preferred way to um, combine and remix content. Um, and in this way, um, I think that they're, and to summarize, like what is the state of something? Uh, and so I'm concerned um, about um, that replacing the kind of community work and uh, source checking and uh, intervention that's represented um, on Wikipedia. I'm, I maybe should also be concerned about that for expertise writ large um, coming from the academy, but right now I'm concerned about it for Wikipedia. And I'm especially concerned that people might um, and I've been spent a lot of time writing prompts and trying to see what can be produced uh, to figure out what kind of content would come back um, from these large language models um, in parallel to, or perhaps for a new editor who thinks they are improving Wikipedia, um, how they might uh, like produce things. And I, I have a very skeptical eye um, towards that, but um, that that's kind of my opening thought. Okay, well, with a skeptical eye, I will now uh, turn that question on its head into um, what are some of the biggest challenges facing Wikipedia that you think generative AI could help us address? And All oh, right, man. well, I guess I'll jump in here. Um, so I think, uh, you know, Wikipedia was an incredible uh, project in the sense of uh, democratizing access to knowledge. Um, and we sometimes forget, I think, in this movement how radical that was to go from, you know, having knowledge contained in libraries and encyclopedias and, you know, paywalled online places and hard to reach archives all over the world uh, to suddenly being available for free on the Internet to anyone who could read a long form text article. Um, but I don't think we've uh, fully reached our mission of sharing free knowledge with everyone in the world who needs it and wants it. And we certainly haven't reached our mission of uh, getting everyone who can and wants to participate in sharing their knowledge uh, to do so. And I think um, with AI tools, uh, it is possible um, that we could really grow and kind of uh, get to that point where we are sharing knowledge, not just with people who can read very long form text articles written at a you know college reading level or above, um, but truly uh, reach out to people uh, in different learning styles, um, in different information processing preferences, uh, and bring free knowledge uh, in a completely different way to a new generation of humans. Um, so I think that's pretty exciting. Can I, I, I completely agree as a teacher, you know, I, 
long time ago, I, I realized that besides motivation, you know, what is needed for, to, to be a good editor of Wikipedia is basically texts, time, talent. And in my case, you know, because I teach, uh, you know, I got a community college, that talent comes in many levels. But now I have a tool that is a language model. That one of the things that it does well is write well, you know, in a clear manner. And so suddenly lots of students who perhaps were not able to write a very clear article can write a clear article. Still, you know, with vetting the sources, et cetera, et cetera, but the actual act of writing has, you know, been opened up to a lot of people that perhaps did not have that. So, yeah. Since, since Leanna asked a hopeful and optimistic question, I'm, I'm glad to talk about those things. I was very much prepared to talk about all the problems, but I'm glad to <laughs> surface the good stuff because we almost, almost always run out of time to talk about the good stuff. So I think um, two, two things recently were really interesting, at least in the past year. A lot of st stuff happens so fast, right? How many, how many people here have heard of a notebook LLM by Google? <laughs> I know, it's, it's, it's amazing, right? If you ever, everyone, everyone's seen that, it's like you can start a session, you can drag the materials in there and say, make podcast. Um, and it's bizarre, bizarrely amazing that they had basically have two like NPR hosts going back and forth talking about something. Now, after the third or fourth version of that, you're like, oh, I see the, I see the pattern or the, the, <laughs> the, the tropes they're doing over and over again. But the first time you hear it is incredible. Um, which means that, for me at least, for Wikipedia content, it gives me some ideas about how we might be able to take what has been written articles and turn them into things that meet people where they are in terms of what content they'd like to consume, the colloquial nature of conversation, and just back and forth. So I thought that was really fascinating. Not that it's a perfect product, but it gives us ideas. The other one is just the amount of video generation that has been done with generative AI is fascinating, because that's the big missing part of our movement for a long time. Some of you may know, like, what, 10 years ago? I was a big advocate of more video. We actually had collaborations in our movement with video companies to do collaborative video editing. That all fell flat. So it may be AI as our way to get to that area of generating TikTok videos. But to me, the more important thing is TikTok-like videos that we can re-edit and optimize. Right now, it's pretty much put stuff in, finished video out, and there's no way to kind of readjust or do things. We need something in between. But it gives me hope that our kind of stalled efforts on multimedia versions of our content could have generative AI as a way to make really incredible content that stays relevant to this next generation of learners, right? Um, so if I may, I totally, I, the moment I saw LM on September 11, when LM brought in the podcast version, I thought, and not so much about my students, but I thought about around the world. They grab a Wikipedia article, they put it there, they listen to it, they understand things they couldn't. I mean, it's, it's just, and you know that Google is going to eventually make it editable. You know that. I mean, like right now we're, oh no, totally, because they did it with videos, right? So now we have videos that we can edit everything. So eventually they will build in the, okay, fix the podcast, da, da, da. So it's, if we just wait a few years, this could be, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna. Uh, Leanna, can I do some that, show and oh, tell? Car Carwell, go ahead. Can I do some show and tell? Yes, you can do some show uh, and tell. I, I, I wanted to, um, uh, I wanted to find a couple of positive examples, um, and it took me a, a while of experimenting before I found something that uh, I was so glad um, I had an LLM for. Um, but this was one of them. Um, so. Um, Wikicode is hard. Um, it's kind of like regex um, in that like it's it there's a handful of people for whom like it fits very easily. Um, and there's a lot of material on Wikipedia that is beautifully formatted in Wikicode like this very complicated table that is extremely hard to update um, <laughs> and which I'm very grateful that I was able to run basically uh, two prompts, um, one with a sentence with the new population uh, statistics is announced by the Bolivian census, um, which is added below um, by uh, Claude 3.5 Sonnet, um, and two with a kind of single reformatting queue. And then I have this lovely thing. I added, manually added the citation in Wikipedia. Um, I uh, would very much like to see that happen a lot. Um, I also think a lot of Wikipedia contribute con uh, consists of data um, that um, we could be um, 
re like exporting data into wiki code a lot faster um using this tool um or using wiki uh or using large language models to help make um scripts um my native language at this point in uh, pro programming is R um, that can generate this kind of wiki code from data. And that is extremely useful because we have a, a fundamental volunteer problem where like, um, you know, who is the senator from uh, an obscure place in an, uh, or like a state level senator at a given place or whatever. These kinds of lists that we have out in the world um, are not getting updated on Wikipedia. It's a major problem. Uh, and we could uh, automate a lot of that um, with some combination of coding um, and and this. Um, I also um, did this. Uh, this is a different kind of AI, um, not strictly generative. Um, this is just OCR, um, but I was able to use um, a button which has been recently added to um, uh, Microsoft Excel to import um, uh, uh, an image as a data set. Um, man, there's a lot of individual like going back and checking and making sure that the numbers are right uh, that follows that process. But it was through that that I was able to generate this data that's in the upper right um, and then produce this uh, graphic that is uh, in, an, in a new like DYK article um, on sit down strikes um, in the world. Um, this is definitely not AI um, that I use this. On the other hand, um, the thing that AI has broken through is the ability to uh, translate this kind of uh, artisan graphing work uh, into code that you can then re reuse in other situations. Um, and I think that that is uh, really useful. So I was able to use uh, chat GPT uh, to convert um, the setting into uh, ggplot2, um, which is a, the R library that does plots, um, and which is um, also, I find like uh, extremely difficult as a human and, and non-computer to like grok uh, doing a lot of the uh, detail work and I was able to push through that. So I think that there's a lot of workflow stuff um, behind the scenes that can really be accelerated by using these kinds of tools. Thanks, Carwell. I think that's a that's a really great example. Um, I want to move, and this is a question for Bob, um, but I know Carwell and Jimena, you both also teach at, uh, at university, so feel free to chime in if you have something to say here. Um, so I think one of the things that we've found at Wiki Education as students are editing Wikipedia as a class assignment is that a certain percentage of them will always cheat, um, and they used to cheat by plagiarizing, and now they're cheating by using LLMs. Um, and so this is something that universities across the world are grappling with of how do we combat uh, academic uh, dishonesty, cheating, um, using generative AI to craft papers um, more broadly. And so Bob, I know you have done a lot of work at the University of Mississippi on working um, on this with the faculty that you have there. Um, how, what sort of learnings have come out of universities who've been grappling with this for the last couple of years that you think could be applicable to the Wikipedia community as well? <clears throat> um, thanks for that question. I want to back up just a second and summarize some of the things I've heard so far. And I completely agree with your statement that the moment of generative AI arriving is very similar to the moment of Wikipedia arriving. And I believe that is because we're in a moment of a shift in literacy. We're in a shift of what it means to read and write. And we don't yet have the tools to really think about and interpret that shift accurately. And so we have to use synonyms and shorthands for those shifts. You know, I happen to believe that Wikipedia, and I don't mean to offend anyone, is not really an encyclopedia. It's Wikipedia. It's encyclopedia similar but it has so many more affordances and so much more, uh, so many different uh, 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 benefits and uh, um, impacts than an, an encyclopedia previously had. But we call it an encyclopedia because when it first came out, that's what it was closest to. So I, when I think about these topics, I think about the fact that, you know, if we think ahead, if we jump ahead one month, we're at the two year anniversary of chat GPT. But if we stay in this month, October 2022, all the technical proficiencies that allow chat GPT to explode in the next month, they all existed. What changed? 
Well, what changed was the format of accessing that data. Think about the chat in chat GPT. What happened was, is we created a new ability to interact with that, and we called it chat, implying I'm a human talking to another human. That is not at all what is happening. That is not a conversation. The artificial intelligence, as we most everyone knows, is just generating tokens based on probabilities and stringing together things that look like sentences and sometimes make sense and sometimes they don't. But you, the human reader, are the one that's making that a conversation because you're applying sentience to what is being offered. It's you, when you read the text, that turn it into a conversation. Prior to that, it's just ones and zeros. Now, that's a very big shift in literacy, obviously. Because previously, writing was written by somebody somewhere. It was created by a human or a team of humans. Maybe humans you know, maybe humans you don't know, maybe humans you trust, maybe humans you don't trust, but still, there was another person on the side of that text. And now, there's not another person on the side of that text. So one of the things I like to try to recenter the conversation about is machines don't write, machines don't read, and machines don't learn. You have to have a human component. Now, where we see the breakthroughs are when we remember our humanity and we remember we are using a tool for the purpose of making knowledge for others to share in. And that's where the brilliance comes in, is when we use these uh, AI generative, generative AI tools to do things that we as humans can't do. When I use Notebook LM and I pop my bibliography in there and it sees connections among sources that I could never see because I just can't read that many articles, it is, I'm using it as a tool and it points me in directions, but the value comes and the knowledge comes only when I bring my humanity to that equation and I bring my 10,000 hours of expertise in digital rhetoric to see what is being put forth by the tools. So I really believe we're in a shift of literacy and I really believe that we use a lot of shorthands to assign uh, parallels to previous things that we understood but those, those things break down pretty quickly, and it's important to remember what the limits of those are. So, sorry to get on my soapbox, but... Go for it. Um, it's, it's an important soapbox. I, I just think it's worth recentering that conversation. So your question really was about cheating in higher education. And so... We, what, le what lessons have you learned what lessons that can be applied to her, Wikipedia? Great. So the term has come out in the research or in digital rhetoric in the last couple of years. It's existed previously, but we're talking a lot about what we call cognitive offloading. So when I go to search and I'm searching for an idea or I'm searching for a piece of text, I'm really just, I'm, I'm searching for a piece of text and I want to incorporate that into a conversation I'm having. It's not usually a ton of cognitive offloading. Uh, when I go into generative AI, if I'm trying to be deceptive, um, that's when cognitive offloading can certainly happen. Uh, when I think about what Andrew just said about how Notebook LM is creating, and I've seen some of these uh, podcasts with two NPR-like people uh, generating a podcast, it does take about a couple of minutes or, you know, about three or four different uh, episodes before it's really clear to the human audience that what they're reading, what they're experiencing is not human generated, right? And so there's just, there's, all, there's a bit of novelty there and there's a bit of lag time there. There are really things that we need to be concerned about. But, but generally, I'm in the process of leading a conversation on my, conver on my campus where we're looking at what other campuses have done on a national and international basis about altering policies to accommodate generative artificial intelligence. And we're fo focusing that conversation on our teaching mission, our research mission, our service missions, and also our business practices. But when it comes to our teaching mission, I, I think there's surprisingly little that needs to change around the concept of plagiarism. I always tell my writers, I assume that what writing you're submitting in my class 
is your own thoughts unless you tell me otherwise. That doesn't really change. I just need you, I need to give you the tools to explain to me how you incorporated generative AI. And that's where faculty need the most help in my experience. So, Carvel? Yeah, I mean, what I wanna say is I started thinking about this from a particular case, right? Which is, uh, I teach a human rights and indigenous peoples class. It was the first uh, large class that I was teaching after um, the proliferation of chat GPT. Um, and so I spent a lot of time trying to like giving it all my prompts, um, seeing what would happen. Um, and, uh, and there, and then, then basically like, I recognize that, uh, uh, Plagiarism detection is like has leveled up. It's a considerably harder thing to do um, in a world of large language models because of the, the ability to rewrite and not uh, reuse uh, words. At the same time, um, what I spend a lot of time talking to my students about is the ways that um, their large language model will generate something that is not optimal for their learning, right? Um, and so, and uh, and I got really specific about that. I, I find that it's a very frustrating writer. Um, it's a very people pleasing writer because um, it is the result of responding to assessments. Um, it is filled with uh, zombie nouns and abstractions. Um, it rarely, uh, rarely shows and rather tells. Um, reaches, right? Um, and so these are things I want students to get better at. Um, and so I'm not con as concerned about, oh, I got you <laughs> for doing it as I am uh, concerned at front loading, getting them committing to understanding what some of the, the weaknesses are. Um, but then particularly around indigenous peoples, um, the, these generic problems of people pleasing um, go alongside a, a specific problem of recycling tropes. Um, and so a lot of the work that we're unlearning um, is things that are conventionally said a lot. There are a lot of text corpuses that say the things that I teach are not true uh, in, in my classes. Um, and so uh, a large language model is gonna spit back um, those a lot of the time. Um, and so I, in that class, um, uh, urge them to only use um, large language models as an object for critique rather than as an object, but a tool for getting to um, what they're doing. And then more generalizably, um, the problem that I, I found is that, um, you know, there's an overall general narrative flow around what has happened with indigenous peoples. Um, and then if you apply a large language model to a specific case, it will regurgitate that general story, right? It will say, this is what I think happened. Um, but uh, it's not actually looking to find, did that happen for this particular people? And this for me is the definition of research, right? Research is taking an important social problem and then looking and seeing how it plays out in a specific circumstance. And large language models, what they will do is take the specific circumstance, add maybe some names and details to the general story and not check um, whether that's true. Um, and so the lack of a fact model um, is is a is a really serious concern, um, and it's one that like I feel like I'm just constantly in this uh, educating pose of like uh, what do you what would you be told um, by this uh, particular technology versus what would you uh, uh, what what is what would you what would research actually lead you to? Um, uh, uh, one last I don't know one more thing. Uh, to show. Um, so I did that for, I asked Wikipedia to write an article about, or sorry, I asked Claude uh, uh, Opus to write a Wikipedia article about a community I know quite well. And then my comments are over here on the right. And so red is like, it's just wrong. Uh, orange is like, it's it's seriously causing a problem. Um, and then green is like, eh, eh, you're recapitulating, but uh, text that's there, but that's, you know, plagiarism-ish. Um, and then uh, some some guesses about what might happen with well, the really extraordinary thing um, that probably an editor would pick up if they did this, a student might pick up, is that they called uh, this incident in which five missionaries were killed by the Wairani in 1958, their first peaceful contact, um, which was... <laughs> amazing. Um, but also, um, uh, they incorrectly said something that happened for a lot of other indigenous peoples, which is the introduction of firearms uh, that came with uh, colonization in many places did cause a lot of increased violence. It did not among the Wairani. There's actually a, a reverse cultural process where an endemic process of uh, traumatized intergroup violence was, was settled down um, through missionization. Um, and then it describes this quite important lawsuit um, against uh, Texaco, now Chevron Texaco, um, 
uh, that uh, r relates to the Awarani, but wrongly says that the Awarani started it when in fact they were never participants in it, or weren't, weren't participants in the litigation initially um, and had to come around. So like, um, these are holes that I don't think um, a moderately uh, educated, aware person who got a first draft from ChatGPT could fix. Um, and so I'm really like, like, I feel like the educating work around this is kind of, um, and it's, it's much harder to fix these than, uh, if, if, uh, a computer tool gave you a list of articles to read, um, or a computer tool gave you some grist for the mill because it's made decent prose <laughs> with them. Um, and so, um, the teaching work of explaining how to not create this kind of prose that is laid in with uh, misconceptions is I think a really like a really important part of our community conversations in a world in which these tools um, are cheap. Um, and it does seem like we're gonna be living in that world for some time. That would um, be a great assignment, Carl Will. Yeah. <laughs> Could I ask a question of Carl Will? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, Carl Will, do you, do you have any theories on why it was so bad in terms like was it drawing on poor sources? Like, is it garbage in, garbage out, or is it just making bad conclusions? I, I think that fundamentally, um, its um, its sourcing is in part uh, across all uh, all indigenous peoples, right? It's like well, Rani are like one example of this. So, what if I just like blend together? Because that um, a bunch of information about how other peoples might have experienced this, Yikes. and then I I add in a few of the special details from here, and that particular blender, it's just there's that blender setting that's there. And the second one is, uh, you know, people assume that lawsuits are brought by the people who are affected by them, but they're not in this case. Um, people are like there are there are high quality law review articles like walking through this whole thing. They exist. They're out in public space. The Wabrani are extremely well studied, um, but um, it's difficult uh to separate the specific case from the general um and um there's not really i think that's the main reason right mm -hmm. um that that the worst errors that are here uh came up can i can i rerun something very quickly with the audience that we did at wikimania absolutely um how many people here heard of the term rag when it comes to ai oh a little bit more than wikimania about 50 percent of you um it stands for retrieval augmented generation right and this just shows you how fast the space moves. Like, I don't think many people were talking about RAG last year, this time. Um, and on top of that, even since Wikimania, there's been a new one, which is Chain of Thought, right? Okay. GPT-01 now, is it called? Yeah, so, what, what, so now the idea is that, okay, you may not be happy with the answer I spit out monolithically at the end of a chat, but I'm gonna now show you my steps, and it might take 30 seconds to generate something rather than three seconds which is refreshing. It's trying to show you the work, right? Um, so I thought the audience might want to look into those two as the trends of this last year, retrieve augmented generation. So instead of depending on just the trained corpus of what it had swooped up with multiple terabytes, what we would call para parametric knowledge, right, was already baked into the model, you can give it contextual knowledge saying, here's a PDF, here's a website, here's a use that as the source for writing a Wikipedia article, right? And the results from those kind of experiments we've been doing are much better Still not great, but much better than saying, draw on your cosmic knowledge that you scraped off the internet and you get problems that Carl will just describe. They're saying, let's mishmash the experience of indigenous peoples to come up with some possible amalgamation of knowledge. And that's just not very satisfactory in the end. Yeah, yeah I think that I have a, a question for you, Andrew, then based on that. So um, I think, you know, we've seen you know, we are not the only industry that is looking with generative AI. Um, and in particular, a lot of the industries that we rely on for our reliable sources are also facing a crisis with generative AI. Um, studies have found that many articles making through the peer review process in uh, journals are actually generated wholly or partly by LLMs. Um, news media has been you know decimated as an industry over the last couple of decades and more and more um, big name uh, publishers are using generative ai text to publish um, you know espn is a, a good example of this of something you would c consider a traditional high quality source for sports journalism and they're using llms to generate uh, game wrap-ups now right for some of the undercovered sports 
Um, as we look at this as a community, and Andrew, I'm going to put this question to you as a longtime editor, and I will apologize because this is kind of a hard question, but you know, how do you see, you know, what policies do you think we as a community of Wikipedians need to adjust or change or consider in light of the challenge that even if we are human-generated content and not using LLMs to generate Wikipedia, the sources that we're feeding into those LLMs to generate it or the sources we are using may be wholly or partly fabricated by an LLM? Well, from a historical perspective, I think it's quite interesting. I didn't, I forgot I had written this until I looked it up the other day, that I don't know how many people have heard Rambot before. How many people have heard of Rambot in English, in English Wikipedia at least? Yeah, I know, I'm from, from my book. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right, I wrote about that. Um, but some of you may know that Rambot in 2002 increased the size of Wikipedia, English Wikipedia, by 40% in like one month. Because what Rambot did was just took all the census data and went down every single small town in the US and just wrote an article about Podunk. You know, Idaho has a population of this, it's this many miles, and it just pumped out those articles. And the funny thing is that our community didn't scream right away. It just kind of allowed for this kind of technical robot to generate articles. So we have a history of kind of not being too scared of a new technology that might have massive implications mm -hmm. in English Wikipedia. Um, and then the thing I forgot is I called it in my book the, the most controversial move in Wikipedia history. And I think it is, because I don't think anything could move 40% of Wikipedia today, but at the time it was a massive hit. Um, and then a lot of people didn't like it, but they thought it wasn't terrible, right? It was kind of nice to start off. And then in some ways, that's kind of what we're in this position of now is like Cunningham's law, right? It's easier to correct something and get the right answer than to ask for something to be written from scratch, right? So a lot of folks are use the content generated from these AI tools as a starting point, but certainly not as publishable right off the bat as the final word, right? And I think in general, you're seeing that. I think I was, I was quite pleasantly surprised. I mean, there are folks in this audience that helped with the early experiments, like Richard Nipel, William, and other folks, we did this generative stuff, we put it on Wikipedia, and we kind of went, are people going to scream? And people were pretty open to us putting ChatGPT-generated articles as starter articles that we corrected and had human eyeballs on. So I think, in general, I've been pretty happy that the community has been fairly measured in terms of how they accept it, but also not rejecting it about right. Commons is a different thing though. <laughs> so we haven't even gotten to commons, but I encourage you to look at the latest signpost where they do a great gallery of just all the different ways that generative images have been used across our movement. Like I'm familiar with maybe English and commons, but they did a great rundown of how French, Spanish, German, Wikipedia are wrestling with this question. And it, it's fascinating to see. Carvel, did you have a comment I, here too? Yeah, I have a follow up on that because I, I weirdly know about Rambot because I've been thinking about how to replicate it for Bolivia um, huh. uh, in a language that I, that I know, right? So I'm not going to learn Perl for this. Um, but um, I do, um, I, what I think is interesting because I, I, I've been living in two open data worlds and one of them is, is uh, Wikimedia's world. Um, and the other is the like uh, uh, reproducible analytical pipeline slash like reproducible research world um, where people are sharing a ton of libraries and other things like that. But it's part of the scientific infrastructure and it's taking um, reproducibility, accuracy and uh, openness about like what is the process of generating things is taken as like like even more extremely I would say than Wikipedians take their fidelity to truth this community is like we are making scientific infrastructure and we're not going to mess this up um, and this is an arena where I think there should be a lot more Wikipedia content that's generated um, by automated but deterministic means um, that people should have scripts that other people can see and access and they can like revise things if there's something wrong with the scripts where the data is driven and honestly like uh, the, the benchmarking as in like how much computing resources this uses is way lower <laughs> um, than, than for LLMs, right? Um, and so it like, um, I, I would like to see like a ton of um, open repositories on GitHub or God, whatever the non-Microsoft equivalent of GitHub um, turns out to be, um, uh, doing this work um, and people producing a lot, like mass producing a lot of content using verified data sources. Um, and I think there's an acknowledgement in that process that you have to do a ton of uh, data cleaning and other things like that. 
Um, and if I can tell one one last story, which is about why is Wikipedia amazing um, for sorting through facts um, in a way in, that's different um, than LLMs. It's about left-handed presidents. Um, so um, does, does anyone have a guess on how many left-handed presidents there are in the US? Uh, the, so there've been 40, can you, can you hear them? Yeah, I can just barely hear. So did, can yeah, someone there, the there's a lot repeat? of different guesses. There's none, there's 20. Anyone else want to shout one out? 15. Two. Wow. Okay. Super. So around 15% of people are left-handed. They're statistically a much higher percentage. It's, it's it turns out the number is, uh, seven plus possibly two. Um, however, large language models all give the same wrong answer um, because it has been shared a lot by like the International Left-Handed Society or something like this. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> it's on the internet a lot. It's a, it's a great listicle, right? It's like, who are the left-handed presidents? Um, one of these names is wrong and the wrong name is Herbert Hoover. He's not left-handed. He was not left-handed. Uh, this is Wikipedia on the right, um, which does solid sourcing, et cetera, um, and had to struggle with the fact that there are reliable sources-ish, um, right, in a bunch of news articles that say eight, um, but that was able to kind of ingest uh, information and decide not to list Herbert Hoover. And uh, there was an awkward conversation on the talk page about that because uh, this is the best source uh, it's from a National Archives blog post um, in which they describe the intense research that they have done uh, to confirm that uh, Herbert Hoover was in fact right-handed. Um, and it, he has a right-handed signature. Um, he's filmed um, signing things with his right hand. Uh, he uses right, right? Like it's really, it's unequivocal. Um, and Wikipedians <laughs> could kind of grok this, um, but uh, large language models, look for the tent, the things that appear next to each other. Um, and uh, don't ask follow-up questions on this one. So I, I asked uh, large language models for evidence. They all gave a similar statement. This one is the most dramatic. Uh, photographs and footage show Hoover, Hoover writing, holding a hat and performing other tasks with his left hand, which is almost directly a rephrase of the blog post about his right hand. <laughs> Uh, it also helpfully claimed that his son said that his father was left-handed, something Wikipedians would leave as unverifiable. And um, in claims that uh, this, uh, his biographer also said so, and then produced a phenomenal uh, sentence about how his uh, ambidexterity in dealing with people and problems was a consequence of his left-handedness. <laughs> um, I don't actually have access to this physical book, so I can't prove it's not in that book, but I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, the large language model made it up. Um, so um, yeah, the the ability, like um, the space that is represented by Wikipedia to um, consider evidence and weigh it and take minority expressed but higher reliability viewpoints over majority expressed but wrong viewpoints is extremely important. Um, and we should be guarding that uh, you know, with our sort of uh, metaphorical lives, right? We should be very much like uh, defending and, and articulating the need for that. Um, e even in a world in which like most, like mo people are mostly reading uh, LLM summaries of things, which I don't necessarily advise. Uh, <laughs> um, I think that we should, uh, the ability to make sure that the fact base is uh, grounded in precisely this kind of collective consideration um, of the relative merits, merits of things is one of the things that Wikipedia uniquely can speak to um, and uh, has a really important public voice in defending. Okay, thanks, Carl. Well, we're running a little short on time here, so I'm going to um, skip to my last question here. Um, and so I want each of you on the panel to answer this question in less than one minute. Um, so this is going to be your challenge here. So the theme of this conference is crossroads, and it seems like we're at a crossroads with whether we should ignore generative AI or embrace it. What path would you recommend we as a community of Wikimedians take? And if we do take that path, where do you see Wikipedia being in five years? Bob, you're holding a microphone, so I'm gonna start with you. Thanks, uh, that would be completely the answer is to lean in. 
uh, to continue to generate um, better understanding of the tools, break through the analogies. Uh, it, we just were using hallucination. I love that. It's, there's no way for generative AI to hallucinate. It's another example of us using an analogy uh, to understand some sort of a, a, a technical problem. So continue to lean in. And so, yes, I think we ought to be using these tools. Yes, I think we ought to fine tune these tools. Yes, I, to, I think that we ought to see them as an extension of information search and retrieval. Um, I'll also just add one thought about my own experience on campus. Um, in my teaching right now, the most, for me, coming into this year, I thought that the most important thing to do for my students was not to necessarily engage AI explicitly, but more so to, to restructure my class to attune to their needs as people who had come from high school largely through a COVID experience. And so that's what I've chosen to do this semester. Okay, Mariana. Uh, all right, so I think we need to embrace the fact that we have always been and will always be a socio-technical project. Uh, we cannot remove the social part of that project. As Carwell was saying, the fact of humans doing the extremely important work of using their human eyes and their human judgment to make decisions about what is factual, reliable, neutral is uh, inextricable from what we do and we cannot lose sight of that. Um, and we need to double down on that in the face of all of the AI slop that's in the world. But we can't forget the technical part. Um, one of my working titles for my keynote uh, earlier was going to be something like um, Diderot didn't have blue links. Um, we are not an encyclopedia, as Bob pointed out. We are something more than that. And we've always embraced the technical side to uh, pres preserve and, and continue to share knowledge in new ways uh, as technology has evolved. Um, and I think we also need to look at AI as a tool, not a scary thing that's going to displace us or destroy us, um, but it's something we can use in smart ways to enable the social project to continue. Thank you. So the short of this uh, for me is yes, we should. Um, we Two things that are important. We have to remember, we talk about these tools as if they were all the same, but they're not. Some of them are very, very different. And right now people are creating open source versions of these that maybe we could use with a little, you know. So. Whenever we talk about them, we just we really should kind of be as you were doing, you know, Andrew. You know, we we're talking about LM, and LM is a really different kind of, you know, um, tool from you know ChatGPT. Not my favorite ChatGPT, by the way. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing that I think so yes, but here's the thing: all of these tools are really, really useful for people who are experts on a subject because you know if the is the you know but it's totally you know, confabulating or missing something that is really important, right? And you can go in and fix it. So I personally don't think it's such a good idea to use it as a starting point, although I can see what you mean, because I actually used it for an article. I used LM the other day for an article. Um, I think that it's better for revising your stuff. Like I said, you have your own ideas, you put them down, okay, they're not so pretty, the bot can help you with that. And it's really good at it. So, you know, that would be, you know, my, my two cents. Definitely a yes. Yeah, I'm, I think Mariana made the, the point really greatly, which echoes what I was talking about with Rambot and everything. We've always been a technical and socio-technical community, and we're gonna embrace those tools. And I think, just to reiterate what I had before, I think this could be, AI could be our way to do the moonshot, which is to get to interactive multimedia. Two things we've been very, very poor in doing. And this keeps us relevant. It keeps us um, in the in play with what Bob mentioned as this new literacy that we're talking about right now. If we just stick with readable pages that mimic an old time encyclopedia, I don't think we're long for this world. Uh, and we need to adjust to that. Hey, Carwell. Maybe I have the courage to be like, uh, mostly no. Right. Um, with with a um, I think that there's a ton of technical uh, like what we need to be doing is centering on verifiability and creation of uh, of behind the scenes tools that can work at scale um, and that LLMs can be useful in as, in the hands of both experts and programmers to generate tools that explain how they got to their results. Um, and so in the domain of the, the encyclopedia in particular, I think it's extremely important that we prioritize um, fidelity to uh, uh, fidelity to fact and transparency in that process. Um, and um, that we 
put a lot of cautions around our use of um, uh, uh, synthesized text as a source of knowledge. Um, at the same time, I I think I've said today the ways that I think that this can be done uh, usefully and carefully. Okay, thank you all. Um, I wanna close with a redo of the uh, poll we had at the beginning, because I'm curious <laughs> if this uh, discussion today changed anyone's mind. Um, so for those of you who came in late, the question is, is generative AI, hold up your hands, is generative AI more of a threat or an opportunity or somewhere in between? And you can uh, toggle your somewhere in between um, if you want. Oh, wow, they did go a little more up. Yeah, I, I think I'm seeing more ups and more uh, more in betweens and fewer. There's there's definitely still some downs, um, but fewer downs than there were before. So um, thank you all for engaging in this uh, this really interesting discussion. I want to particularly thank the five panelists here, including Carwell, who is joining us remotely. Um, I learned a lot and hope you all did too.